Hi, welcome to Reality Check. Uh, I have a friend of mine and colleague, uh, Biju Krishnan, um, back to talk about EU AI Act. This is a very important subject for all of us because it will have a big impact on um, not just on the companies, but on, on the whole society. Uh, Biju, uh, welcome back. Yeah, thank you, Ilya, for having me again. Excellent. So let's start with the basic question. Uh, EU AI Act. Now it's becoming more reality. Last time we talked about the possibility of implementing it, and now it's become uh, uh, agreed upon. So what does this act cover? The act covers AI systems in general, uh, and it aims to protect our fundamental rights because of the perceived risk from AI systems, which, are, uh, ten which tend to be autonomous in nature, uh, making decisions on our behalf, and hence to protect the society from any impact that we perceive these systems would have on our rights, uh, the act was uh, formulated by the legislators. Okay, and uh, is there uh, a classification of different uh, systems? Yeah, so the act doesn't apply universally on all AI systems. Uh, they have uh, they have adopted a risk based approach where they have classified or they, they have provided guidance to classify systems into uh, three categories like low or no risk, uh, and then there is high risk, and then there is the prohibited systems. So when we talk about low and no risk, we talk about spam uh, like filtering. That's an example. Uh, your emails get filtered out uh, automatically. Uh, there's no rule or there's no law that's going to govern those systems. We talk about high risk systems, where which are primarily like uh, you know, workplace, AI used in workplace or uh, AI used for social scoring and things like that, uh, they will be classified as high risk. And then the prohibited systems, like uh, there was a lot of discussion on uh, biometric scanning, for example, uh, and uh, 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 like just there are, there are a few exceptions where law enforcement agencies can use biometric scanning and AI in biometric scanning. But um, uh, generally speaking, those kind of systems will be prohibited. Uh, for adoption in the EU. Okay. Are there any penalties for uh, violating these laws? Yeah, so of course, when the act will be uh, in effect, uh, you might see um, a fines, or like when you violate these uh, laws, then you might see fines of up to 35 million euros or 7% of the total worldwide annual turnover. Uh, for the preceding financial year for any company or organization that violates these laws. Does it apply to uh, only to European companies or to every company that has business in Europe? Yeah, it applies to the latter, which is every company that has business in Europe. So it has this extraterritorial um, reach, uh, similar to what we saw in the case of GDPR, where any a company or organization that is offering services in the EU has to comply with this law. Okay. And uh, when this uh, is going to become a law, so when it will be enacted? Yeah, so the timeline goes like this. The, there has been political agreement now uh, among the EU legislators on very a lot of the controversial topics, uh, like, for example, biometric scanning. Like earlier, it was predicted that uh, no agency or no one will be allowed to use biometric scanning or use of AI in biometric scanning. But now there are exceptions for the law enforcement agencies to um, get permissions on a case by case basis, for example. So the political agreement has been reached. Now, in the coming weeks, there will be uh, the technical um, formulation of these laws. Uh, then the EU parliament will discuss it. Uh, and we hope that by June next year, before the next EU elections, the law will be ratified. And then the companies and organizations have uh, two more years to uh, kind of prepare for the uh, application of this law. And then uh, in, let's say, 25 or 26, we will see the law in effect uh, okay. across the EU. So while it seems like a long time, uh, I'm sure uh, this is a very, very big topic. So the companies should prepare uh, to today. So what's your recommendation? What companies should do starting uh, probably before Christmas? Nobody will do anything. But after 
uh, new year? What companies should start doing immediately? Yeah, so my experience is that uh, the level of AI governance in most organizations is, is at a very, let's say, basic level. Some don't even have AI governance uh, because AI itself is, uh, let's say, a new topic for many organizations. So I would say the first thing that every company should do is to assess the, their level of AI governance, uh, their level of uh, understanding of how AI ethics is being incorporated into their uh, applications and also set up the framework for classifying their systems into these low risk and high risk and prohibited uh, uh, categories. So, so if you don't know where your systems fall, you wouldn't know when to apply, uh, when these laws would be applicable to you. So I would okay. say- Are there any companies that can help them do this uh, or people? So um, uh, what are the practical steps? Yes, yeah, so they, they need to do the assessment. They need to understand how ethical they are, but uh, they have never done this before. So how do they do this? Yeah, so there are many uh, like guidelines already being published for conformity assessments. Uh, there are organizations out there to help as well. Um, like, for example, uh, the IEEE um, standards, which is called certified. Uh, it's also available. There are certified assessors who can help companies assess their um, applications um, against the framework. And that should give them a fair uh, bit of, uh, let's say, lead into uh, understanding what is required when this law is being applicable. Uh, also, there are organizations like TUFSUD, for example, the, you know, the standard certifying body. Um, they are also preparing to provide services. They already have services that uh, can help you um, get uh, certif certification marks for your applications. Uh, just an idea that came uh, to me. Uh, maybe you should build the AI model that will be able to help you do the assessment. Uh, yeah, so it will so. learn everything about the legislation on AI and you can ask questions. I'm building this, so what, what's my classification? What should I do? Yeah, I guess that should be easy, like uh, creating a retrieval augmented generation uh, system where you can query the app. But um, ethics is anyways not something uh, where, like there are a lot of gray areas where you can debate on whether something is ethical or not. So there'll always be a human element uh, into judging uh, what kind of uh, rules are applicable or whether the system is even allowed or ethically good enough to be uh, launched in public. So I think there will be always be a human element, no matter how much we automate this whole process. Yeah, we certainly hope that will not become obsolete. So we want to put ourselves uh, into every discussion, um, uh, insert ourselves into a, every decision. So that's probably not a bad idea. Yeah. So um, uh, let, let's assume that EU will adopt this act, um, or we are pretty certain that EU will do that. So will that put European Union and Europe at disadvantage from the perspective of techno technological development? Yeah, so I have the answer, I would say in the short term, there is disadvantage. Uh, and in the long term, we, we th I think that there will be advantage. So the short term is that investors will shy away from investing in AI companies in Europe, perhaps because it's a regulated industry. So um, that's the, the, the impact that I foresee, especially in areas like uh, technologies that were being promoted to uh, automate emotion assessment of employees, for example. Those will be in, in a way even prohibited in the EU. And any company that was already building software for this will either move to another continent or will continue to um, work here, but with increased oversight. So short term, yeah, we will see an impact. Uh, of course, the EU is trying to, uh, along with the EU AI, they will also perhaps come up with some incentives for startups, for small and medium enterprises to uh, encourage them to build in EU. So we will, we, we think that there will be some more, uh, let's say, messages coming out from the parliament. In the long term, though, because um, anyways, we need to regulate AI. Every continent, every country is thinking about it. So the fact that EU has taken a lead will mean that products coming out of EU will perhaps uh, be considered as higher quality or safer than products coming out of other continents. So in that sense, I think in the long term, there will be a positive effect of, of this act. 
Yeah, I'm sure somebody from legislation office is listening to uh, uh, Biju and myself. And uh, my recommendation to you guys is make sure that when you regulate things, you also add incentives uh, to develop the right things, to develop the safe AI models, to develop uh, controlled, um, uh, moderate risk systems, but that can be used for a better good of society. So we certainly need uh, the incentives as well, not just regulations. Yeah, one incentive they have already discussed in the EU AI Act is the provision of a sandbox, where let's say you're a startup developing a product that will be uh, probably classified as high risk. You can bring that into the sandbox free of cost uh, to, to for the regulators to already start checking it out and you know in, uh, giving you clear guidance on what is the implication for such system. So they, that kind of uh, framework is already being proposed in the EU AI Act. So it's some kind of a, let's say, relief for a startup that's probably already building or is planning to build a high-risk AI system. Not good enough from my perspective. Not, not enough. Uh, should, be, should be more uh, done in this space, especially the VC uh, uh, environment in the EU uh, leaves a lot to be desired, to be honest. Yeah, so there has been like some legislators have said like when we propose the EU AI Act, we should also at the same time uh, create a fund for SME yep. startups, uh, financial uh, backing that is already like, so it shouldn't be seen as we are reg only regulating and not promoting innovation. Both should go hand in hand. Perfect. Yeah, I would love, I would love to do one more interview with you and talk about the incentives that exist for companies uh, to build the AI models. I believe uh, AI can do a lot to increase our productivity and make our lives much better. Um, uh, at least increase the service level that um, is a little bit lacking uh, in Europe uh, these days. My last question uh, to you, Biju, is um, it's always important to understand uh, who are the beneficiaries. So who will benefit from this act? So first of all, the whole idea is to create benefit for the society and uh, respect our, you know, like protect our fundamental rights. So that's like the noble agenda, if you may call it. But of course, the, uh, the fallout of such a law, as we saw in the case of GDPR as well, will be a, a lot of uh, services, new services that can be created. Like, you know, like, as I said, like I myself, I'm preparing... Uh, for becoming an assessor, which is basically, a, you know, something that I will profit from. Uh, legislators are also getting happy because now they have a say in what is uh, good and what is bad. So they are finding, you know, they are placing themselves into a position of importance there uh, because they also realize that AI will be a fundamental part of our society going forward. And how can legislators not be part of uh, this, um, this uh, sphere? So yeah, and then we also see, I think I also foresee, uh, you know, certification quality standards uh, companies, which, you know, provide these marks of yeah, safe and certified. Uh, they will also create a host of services that cater to this segment. So yeah, there, there will be definitely beneficiaries, including me, uh, if uh, this act uh, comes into force. Yeah, I can add a couple more uh, categories. I expect that consulting companies will definitely be on the receiving side. Uh, and I would expect that the companies that do training uh, will benefit as well. So uh, uh, there's lots of people that will have a direct um, uh, financial interest uh, in that. But more importantly, to make sure that we have in Europe the thriving community of developers that build the um, safe, reliable, and uh, do good uh, AI systems. Yeah, so one reason I, why I got into the game uh, or the whole area is that I found that most of the people uh, learning this uh, or understanding AI ethics are mostly are coming from academia. And I found that it would be very pertinent for a person like me who has put models in production to also understand what how to regulate or how what are the implications of these laws uh, so that I can guide the companies in the, let's say the easiest possible way to uh, meet those standards. So rather than filling checklists, we could perhaps automate 
the process like you just mentioned why can't we train a model to understand the act for example so those kind of uh, practical measures could actually ease the whole process and that's why i personally got into this uh field of ai ethics great uh, we need people like you uh, in this field people that have the hands-on experience in deploying the complex uh, solutions in the enterprise space uh, Biju, thank you so much for uh, coming back at short notice to discuss this very important topic of EU AI Act. And uh, I'm sure we'll uh, meet again for more uh, interviews to talk about the uh, incentive programs for, uh, uh, especially for the startups. That's the topic I'm uh, very curious about. Thank you. And um, uh, all to all viewers, uh, don't forget to subscribe uh, to uh, Gen AI Reality Check channel. And uh, please visit uh, uh, Biju's um, website that I'll put in the description for this video. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. Bye-bye.